Name at the top of its list of prayers and thanksgivings. A couple of weeks ago on Friday, a priest I know took her cue from the prayer book and prayed earnestly for a change in the weather. As sheets of rain cascaded down on the following Sunday morning, she was furious to discover that her umbrella had been stolen from the vestry. There is, of course, a problem with praying for rain. It suggests that God can simply change the weather for our convenience in a way that's both unscientific and selfish. Why should God do things just for us? Yet cause and effect on the global scale are anything but simple. Tiny changes in one place can contribute to tornadoes thousands of miles away, the butterfly effect. So my prayer for rain could in theory contribute to a change in the weather, even if it's only by the exhalation of my parched breath, sending a microscopic ripple through the atmosphere, which builds into a thunderstorm, probably in another part of the world. When it comes to English weather, there'll always be a high degree of unpredictability. The relationship between cause and effect is often lost in a storm of complexity. I see prayer as an intensification of human desire. In some sense, we're all praying all the time for what we most deeply want and need. In the prayer book, adverse weather is a warning from God. The prayer for rain is followed by a prayer for fair weather, which pleads with God not to drown the world. Though we for our iniquities have worthily deserved a plague of rain and waters, yet upon our repentance send us such weather as that we may receive the fruits of the earth in due season, and learn both by thy punishment to amend our lives, and for thy clemency to give thee praise and glory. I used to smile at that rather grovelling attempt to appease God, but the words don't quite sound quite so bizarre these days. The ongoing heatwave across much of Europe is at least an opportunity to reflect on the part we might be playing in changing the Earth's climate. Of course, no single weather event can be proved to be the result of global warming, but the heating of the Earth does make summers like this more likely. So perhaps praying for rain reminds us that our planet is fragile, a gift and not a commodity. And this could stir us to remember that our, our future life here is still conditional on the decisions we make today. And that was Thought for the Day with Angela Tilby. The time is nine minutes to eight. And the current heat wave has probably made some people think about global warming in a new and more concrete way. A report released today is warning of the risks of a hothouse earth triggered by global temperatures rising by around two degrees above pre-industrial levels. Currently, we are at about a one degree rise. The authors of the report warned that once we hit two degrees, the earth's natural equilibrium could be irreversibly disrupted. Uh, we're joined by Professor Johan Rockstrom, executive director of the non-profit at Stockholm Resilience Centre, who is... ...been shifting back and forth between ice age and interglacial periods and cycles of roughly 100,000 years. And we are now in an interglacial. We've been there since the last ice age, some 12,000 years back. And at one degree Celsius rise of temperature that we have caused, humans have caused by burning, and we're reaching the edge of the highest temperatures on Earth in all the interglacials, over the last one million years. So that shows that we're starting to reach or hitting the ceiling of the biophysical limits of a stable planet. Secondly, we have so much evidence today that the biosphere, the living natural part of the planet, have the ability to absorb and dampen our warming by sucking up carbon dioxide, taking up heat, reflecting back heat from ice sheets, and that this capacity is what has kept the planets that rapid ice melts, makes them makes ice sheets absorb more heat than reflected back. We're seeing permafrost thawing, we're seeing, you know, lessened capability of oceans and though it's not a worst case scenario, it's an intrinsic biophysical non-negotiable part of how the Earth system is configured. Executive Secretary from the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change, that's the organization that worked towards uh, the Paris... The Sweden, uh, California and many other places and uh, we're trying to bring all that science and the politics and the debate to closer to home, so to speak, and uh, inform the world at large that how serious it is uh, the situation it's not no longer cyclical and as the professor said in very uh stark being term scientific facts uh, that it is extremely serious and we have to do something about it now and paris agreement is the uh, framework which has a very 
solid and robust framework that if we to implement now, soon, sooner than yes. uh, but, but there are lots of there are lots of doubts, aren't there, about whether it's going to be implemented as planned, and indeed, even if sticking to uh, to to a two degree target, even if if it is possible to stick to that, it is. There are doing. I'm actually an optimist, and I'm very hopeful that uh, uh, increasing the ambition and explaining to the general public the impacts, and as we're seeing it now. We can we can uh, prevent the damages that uh, the professor had explained. Professor Rockstrom, do you, do you share that 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 optimism that the damage can be prevented, or do you think we need a lot more ambition in policy on this area? The, the damage can be limited. We also know that uh, we we not only can decarbonize the world economy aligned with the Paris Agreement, we also benefit from it. We have more and more evidence about the economy, our health socially and equitably, even security-wise, we gain from decarbonizing and becoming sustainable. This paper led scientific support for the Paris Agreement, and it shows that we should do everything we can to avoid reaching 2 degrees Celsius and aim for the 1.5 degrees. Remember that the writing is, stay well below 2 in the Paris Agreement. Johan Rockstrom, Professor Rockstrom and Ove Sarmad of the United Nations. Thank you both. Well, it is weather forecast time though, Darren. Tell us we're going to have some rain, please. Hmm, later on in the week, perhaps into the weekend, but uh, the main thing is that it will be turning cooler and fresher everywhere by tomorrow. Still a hot and humid day today in southeast England and eastern England. Temperatures perhaps up to 32 degrees, plenty of sunshine this morning, a bit more cloud this afternoon, threatening an isolated shower south of London. Those could develop a little more widely and move northwards uh, during this evening. Some thunderstorms are possible. Midlands, northeast England, sunny skies this morning, lifting temperatures quickly into the mid to perhaps high 20s, more cloud this afternoon moving in from the west but probably staying fine and dry. Different story further west though for Wales and western England a very weak weather frontier bringing a little bit of uh, light rain and drizzle this morning that should die out this afternoon a little sunshine at times but much more cloud than yesterday and it will be cooler as well 19 to 21 Celsius a bit of uh, rain and drizzle for south east Scotland this morning before conditions improve sunny spells developing more widely a few showers in the northwest of Scotland Leland does not move and oddly feels no fear you men, take cover! Why did I have to be so clever? Why couldn't I leave it alone? Repetition, yes. Some on BBC Radio 4. Audience shout out, I'm a disgrace! <laughs> Is too much sleep bad for you? That's a question we'll be addressing later in this programme. And preparations for the millennium bug. What do they tell us about a no deal of Brexit? You're listening to Today on Radio 4 with John Humphreys and Michelle Hussein. It's 8 o'clock on Tuesday the 7th of August. The headlines this morning. Donald Trump has said he'll fully enforce the wide-ranging sanctions that Washington has just reimposed against Iran to try and bring it back to bring it back to the negotiating table over its nuclear program. Labour has ended its disciplinary action against Dame Margaret Hodge after her row with Jeremy Corbyn over his handling of anti-Semitism in the party. Scientists have given a warning that the world could tip into uncontrollable levels of climate change that would make parts of the Earth uninhabitable. And the American billionaire Stan Kroenke has made an offer to buy the whole of Arsenal Football Club. The BBC News is read by Neil Sleet. Wide-ranging US sanctions against Iran have come into force this morning. They target the country's currency, precious metals trade and automotive sector. They've been reapplied because of President Trump's decision to withdraw from the international agreement to curb Iran's nuclear program. Tehran has dismissed Mr. Trump's view that the sanctions could be a precursor to a new deal, saying it was akin to stabbing a right here. The administration promising to enforce them aggressively and put a further huge strain on the Iranian economy, already in something of a downward spiral, also exacerbate the rift between the US and some of its key allies who have remained committed to the original agreement. Iran's president, Hassan Rouhani, has accused the United States of psychological warfare. He said Washington's actions were incompatible with any future nuclear negotiations. The Trump administration has insisted it's looking for behavioral change rather than regime change in Tehran, but is demanding any future talks should include what Mr. Trump has called Iran's malign activities in the region. 
Meanwhile, the president is promising severe consequences for any companies that breach the new restrictions. But the EU has already said it will attempt to shield European firms from the sanctions. The European Union plans to use a so-called blocking statute which will prevent EU companies from applying the sanctions and allow them to seek damages. Natalie Tocci, a special advisor to the EU's foreign policy chief, Federica Mogherini, explained why the EU was intervening. It's a tremendously important step to take from a political stroke symbolic standpoint, essentially because it signals to the Iranians, as well as obviously to the rest of the international community, that the EU is actually moving so as to respond and to try and contain the impact of US secondary sanctions. A fresh row has erupted between the Labour leadership and the senior backbencher Dame Margaret Hodge, despite the party dropping its investigation into her over a confrontation she had with Jeremy Corbyn about anti-Semitism. Labour said Dame Margaret had expressed regret for her conduct, prompting her lawyers to issue a denial and accused the party of entirely misrepresenting her in a cynical attempt to save face. Is our political correspondent Jessica Parker. A Labour Party source said the inquiry had ended after Dame Margaret expressed regret for the way in which she'd raised her views. But last night, the MP released a scathing letter from her lawyers. It described the party's decision to drop the investigation as a climb down and insisted that their client would not apologise as she'd done nothing wrong. The MP, who lost family in the Holocaust, confronted her party leader last month and publicly accused him of being an anti-Semite. Labour has insisted that it's determined to drive out anti-Semitism for good. The sticking point has been the party's decision not to adopt in full the examples listed in an internationally recognised definition of anti-Semitism. Dame Margaret says it must now do so, while another Labour MP, Chris Leslie, is calling for the Commons to debate and adopt the definition when Parliament returns from recess in the autumn. Scientists have given a warning that the world is at risk of tipping into extremely dangerous levels of climate change, which could make some areas uninhabitable and result in sea levels rising by up to 60 metres. A team of international researchers say the so-called hothouse earth climate could be triggered by a global rise in temperature of one more degree Celsius. One of the authors of their report, Professor Johan Rockström, told us cracks in the resilience of the Earth's systems were already evident. We have already one degree Celsius indications that rapid ice melts makes them makes ice sheets absorb more heat than reflected back. We're seeing permafrost thawing. We're seeing, you know, less of the capability of oceans and land and forest to take up carbon dioxide. The scientists, the science that is published, start indicating that two degree Celsius may be a threshold when these tipping points occur. Surrey's Police and Crime Commissioner has announced an independent review of the collapse of the trial of the former DJ Jonathan King. He was accused of 23 serious sexual assaults against boys, allegations he denied. It's emerged the trial was halted in June. Keith Doyle reports. The Police and Crime Commissioner for Surrey, David Munro, said the judge's decision to halt the trial made very difficult and concerning reading. He said there were fundamental failures in the disclosure process and he was sorry for all those involved who had been badly let down by what he called this unacceptable and troubling situation. Surrey Police confirmed there would be no further action against Jonathan King, who is 73, and he would not be retried over alleged historical sex offences. The force said it recognised that there were serious organisational failings in the investigation. Jonathan King was previously found guilty of sex offences against five youngsters aged 14 and 15. The solicitors said they had long expressed concerns about the recent investigation, which they considered lacked sufficient objectivity. A woman has been pulled alive from a collapsed building on the Indonesian island of Lombok as the search for survivors of two major earthquakes continues. Nearly 100 people are known to have died in the latest quake on Sunday, but officials say the number of dead is likely to rise. The Foreign Office says it's working with the Indonesian authorities to help British tourists who've been stranded. Richard Wecker from the UN children's charity UNICEF is helping the Indonesian government coordinate the relief effort. He told us what assistance the people of Lombok now needed. Medical support teams and medical, medical personnel to, to support with immediate life-saving interventions. Clean water and food are, uh, are obviously um, some of the immediate needs of uh, the affected population as well as Blankets, mats and tents uh, as most of the houses have been leveled. 
A longtime business associate of Donald Trump's former campaign chairman, Paul Manafort, has told a jury he helped his ex-boss file false tax returns and hide his foreign bank accounts. Rick Gates is appearing as a government witness against Mr. Manafort, who denies charges of bank and tax fraud. The case is the first criminal trial arising from the investigation into alleged Russian interference in the 20th.